All new in the night team, we do want to warn you right away that some of the images you're going to see in this next story are very graphic. It's a self-proclaimed animal refuge in southern Indiana. It's called Wildlife in Need. And tonight, the USDA is one step closer to shutting it down. Our Focus investigative team started looking at a wildlife in need almost a year ago. After bringing whistleblower claims to the USDA, the feds have revoked the facility's license and fined the owner more than $300,000. Here's Focus investigator Shay McCallis. Big circle, big circle. 30 people file into the room. Welcome to Wildlife and Need, everybody. They've each paid $25 to be here. <laughs> to watch Wildlife and Need owner Tim Stark introduce some of his exotic animals. Are y'all ready to get <laughs> animals to do? The access is unmatched. Animals up close and personal. <laughs> But we didn't just go to see the show. We went looking for something else. Something former staffers say is easy to miss when you're inside this room. They're missing how many animals are crying behind closed doors. They're, they're not seeing the moldy food or no food at all. They're not seeing the lack of water. Um, they're not seeing open wounds that aren't being treated. Jordan Jones used to volunteer at Wildlife in Need. So did Kyra, Carly, Lauren, and three others who didn't want to be named, but did want to tell their story. And if they're dying anyway, what, what's there to be afraid of by trying to stand up for them? Founded in 1999, the facility is registered as a nonprofit dedicated to rescuing and rehabilitating indigenous wildlife. It is not what it claims to be. It is not a rescue, it does not rehabilitate, it does not release animals that go there. They suffer a very terrible life. You don't realize the red flags that you're seeing then, you know, but now looking back, there were so many. Nearly 500 pages from this USDA case file detail complaints, incidents, failed inspections, and more. It took us nine months to get our hands on the documents. Records show allegations of neglect go back at least 10 years. He's been operating since 1999. This has always been something that has been swept under the rug. It's the norm. According to USDA records, the facility housed 43 animals in 2012 and nearly 300 only six years later. Former staffers tell us the numbers are even higher than that now, but the amount of help has never been enough. Inspectors have cited the facility at least twice for insufficient staff, resulting in a lapse of animal care. They didn't have knowledgeable people there, um, and I don't think they had enough people there, even with all the volunteers. Systematic breakdown seemingly started seven years ago, when several animals died, according to USDA records. A serval, ocelot, and Cotamundi died without explanation. I've never, in the two years I was there, never saw a vet. In March of 2017, tiger cubs declawed, later ruled a violation of the Animal Welfare Act, but not before the paws got infected, swelling with pus. It was awful. Like, I walked in and I, I immediately wanted to throw up. Former staff we spoke to said wildlife and need owners refused to bring in an expert to administer care. And I could not believe that an animal that needed medical attention, medical care, and medical and medication, he was refusing to give. Kaiki died within a week. Facility owners were cited for lying about their vet. Inspectors uncovering the vet they listed for the facility did not agree to provide care for all animals at the facility. Later that year, another suspicious death. Inspectors noting the owner described euthanizing a snow leopard by hitting it with a baseball bat. Instead of waiting for the vet to get there, he said a proper form of euthanasia was um, blunt trauma to the head repeatedly. More than just a lack of proper medical attention, former staff describe a lack of everyday necessities. Inspection reports detail enclosures without water, feeding animals expired meat and roadkill, a food storage room with an excessive accumulation of rodent feces on the floor, and again and again, lack of enrichment. We were taught to call their cages enclosures, but they are cages. They're not habitats. They're not 
uh, the plants, they're not the environment that that animal is supposed to be in. Former staff gave us these pictures, showing a reptile living in a plastic toolbox. Clark County 911, what is the address of your emergency? This animal and others housed in the reptile barn. 3320 Jack Teeple Road. Yeah, my barn's on fire. Your barn is on fire? Yeah. And then I remember I received a text message saying, oh, sorry, Jordan, guess you don't get to work with the reptiles now because they all died. And and I was actually uh, made fun of uh, by Tim and another uh, staff member because I got upset because he died. And they, they like made a joke out of it. At least 40 animals died in that 2016 fire. Fire inspectors investigated, but never released a cause. The fire was portrayed as a tragedy, uh, an accident, but from some of the things I've seen there, I think that was also just neglect, just being in over your head. The staffers call what's happening here hoarding and say it's led to animal neglect, animal escapes, and people have gotten hurt. County 911, what is the address of your emergency? I need an uh, ambulance, please. June 2019, it was one of their own. Okay, what's going on there? An animal bite. Okay, what kind of animal bite? Uh, I know. I'm going down there now. He said he's wounded. Graphic pictures from the scene showed the damage. The hyena latching on to the man's arm, ripping it open. According to the incident report, he was trying to get the escaped animal back into a cage. One man claims responsibility for everything that's happened on this property. That man is Tim Starr. And a 30 minute drive from Louisville puts us on his property where he agrees to an interview. I mean, it's kind of funny how they'll sit there and say, oh, well, look at this, it wasn't clean. Oh, look at that, it wasn't done. Oh, whose freaking job was it? Theirs. It was their job to clean that damn, that same exact cage that they wanted to take a picture of that wasn't clean. It was their responsibility. That reflects back on me? I don't think so. We know you have questions about what happens next. What happens to those animals? And we have the same questions. What we can tell you is Tim Stark has 35 days to appeal the decision. Until that deadline, he can continue operating as usual. We talked to him today, and he told us he plans to do just that. For Focus, I'm Shay McAllister.